major transportation companies in the locomotive industry group. So it is both. But you've got to understand when you enter it, are you in the linear segment of the business or are you in the exponential? And you better not get the two confused because you'll get crushed in the process. But it is the realization that big companies and small companies are moving. It's a realization that the world's remarkably equal because it isn't given that a physical and a digital world, the two together, will win. The virtual world, going to be tough competitors. The physical world has tremendous brand advantage. But thinking about how this changes everything is key. Enabled by fast IT. When we did this in Barcelona a year ago, to be very candid, there were two cities that really stood out in the world, Songdo and Barcelona, as examples of really smart cities. When you come here to Chicago, watch how fast they're gaining the leadership, first in the U.S. and maybe globally. And if you haven't been on the street walk with what goes on and how they combine it here in Chicago, what are their current plans and where they're going, I strongly encourage you to do it. But the key takeaway I'm making is you are able to now talk about a dozen cities, from Riyadh being able to do this, to thinking about where you're going to go around the world, Berlin's dreams and aspirations on being able to make a difference, Nice, France, with the way they interface to their citizens in a dramatically different way, Hamburg and Germany, which will be probably the example for the eight or nine major city build-outs there, etc. Government leaders get it. And this goes back to, if you're going to be a good government leader, what are the two best things you need to do? A good economy and happy citizens. They understand that the impact to create an equality environment, regardless if you're in developing world or developed world, will be around this. And the ability all of a sudden for Germany to think about an industry 4.0 being their vehicle, by the way, this is Chancellor Merkel's words, to skip a generation. They led clearly in the industrial revolution in many segments, such as automotive, but they missed the technology segment. Now they see the two coming together, and if they do this right within Germany, it will be 1% to 3% growth on their GDP and make them much more competitive as a nation. But guess what? When you talk to Cameron, he gets it too in the UK. He understands it's about innovation, creating a good environment for business to occur. It's about how do you take issues like the Olympics and build on them to capture the imagination of a country. And they have literally eight innovation centers that we develop jointly together to develop what-if scenarios. So as you see this occur, we want to be able to translate depending on which industry we are and how we go. Israel is the most independent technology state in the world. Only 7.5 million people, more startups per capita, a factor of 10 or 15 fold than any other country in the world. And yet they had a complete agreement between their three major political parties on what digital Israel should be. And by the way, when they talked about this, they didn't talk technology or connectivity. What they talked was a digital state that focused first on GDP growth, focused second on job creation, third on an inclusion of minorities, the 20% of the population that is Arab that were not participating in the economic growth they were seeing, the Orthodox Jewish population who was returning to work. They were talking about how you change health care and education for every Israeli to every home with video capabilities. How do you move your cities to the south? How do you lead in defense? And how do you get the next generation of IT companies together? Their structure is largely Cisco with our partners. But what they were after was all business outcomes and the ability to bring an ecosystem to bear to get the benefits. If you think about it from a city perspective and a port perspective, the most modern port in the world is now being built out of Hamburg. They are the most efficient already within Europe, and they're going to increase their efficiency by increasing the capacity by 2x while reducing their cost. It's an environment when you look at statistically, it really gets you excited if you love numbers. It is literally 83 different train stations and different companies coming into the port, 1,200 ships a year coming into it, tens of thousands of trucks and connectivities of containers, and then hundreds of thousands of cars moving about. And they did a classical in silos and tried to tie it together, and it didn't work. But when they came together with an ecosystem, and a number of us in this room came together to work on this, it completely transformed the port. Then they transformed the city. Then they tied it into uh, Deutsche Bahn, the transportation system that brings it out. And this is when I get excited about understand the payback. The number's undeniable. And that's where you suddenly see this hype. We're finally starting to deliver on it. And anybody thinks this hype is going to level off at this level just doesn't understand this market. I was there during the 90s with the first phase of the Internet. We are in the early innings in terms of opportunity. 
But you're seeing people move again and again. City of Chicago. What the mayor has done here has truly been amazing. You look at the unemployment rate, 2.8%, down literally uh, dramatically the most in the last 12 months of any other major city in the country. An education system which suddenly is getting kids no longer to drop out of high school. An ability to capture this with imagination and power and what's possible, where they literally, when you look at what is going on, have 28 different sub-focus areas and uh, in terms of initiatives and five strategies. An innovation office that really thinks about a smart data platform that receives seven million lines of data per day and interprets that in terms of what does it mean from everything from traffic control to snow plows to garbage collection, etc., to 311, the normal interface, back to the citizens. Ability to capture this video in a way that people grasp and understand what's possible in terms of crowdsourcing and crowd control. Manufacturing, the number one issue, the things that manufacturing worrying about is, is my line down. If your line is down 5%, you don't make any money. Most effective manufacturing organizations run at 1%. We think together we can take that way down at least by half. And it comes together with a company like Hardy Davidson with just a great brand name. But they literally introduced with players such as Rockwell, Cisco, and others, how do you really change that assembly line? Not only to cut the downtime at least in half, but also how do you introduce new products at 10 to 20% faster speed? Now, the reason I'm walking through this is this is how I'd like for each of us to think about how do we communicate what we do together to be able to bring it to life in terms of the market. And all of a sudden, you see a very broad group of partners that are required from the IT community to work together, from the manufacturing community that are working together, et cetera. And it usually requires a minimum of three to four of us on each major project. If you think about what this means, it also means that IT has to change. IT organizations around the world are organized like they were 10 or 15 years ago, focused on applications and networking and storage and the data center being the hall that you want to be a part of. Application groups of the future will be so deeply embedded in services that it will be all about providing a service to the customers so that you can get fast IT, where the CIO is really the orchestrator of what we do together, as opposed to the builder of all this herself or himself. And so as you think about how we do this, we've got to say, how do we do it with our joint customers? So when you have people like Brennan, who's the CIO here in the city of Chicago, she gets it. She really understands how to do it. Now, I think the mayor can push her even tougher, which I'm going to tell him later, because <laughs> I think she's very talented and her team can deliver. But she delivers it through a host of partners. How many of you saw the Rio Tinto uh, presentation? Wasn't that amazing? I said, you know, the kiss of death is when you say, you're my chief innovation officer, now go make it happen. I, waited until I knew that I could say that to him without him getting mad at me, because he is the chief innovation officer. I said, what did you do differently? He said, John, it was simple. I'm in charge of innovation and strategy, and I have less than 70 people. I do it all through an ecosystem. That's why I'm able to move quickly and reinvent the company. So I am talking about a different degree of fast IT. And when you think about fast IT, we in the... High-tech community have to make... It's simple... and secure and we've got to read smart, to Doug's points earlier, about intelligence throughout the network, the ability to program both with merchant ASICs, i.e. Intel x86 and custom ASICs. 
and the ability to bring those together in a way that others cannot to achieve the goals. But it's also about organizational change, because as you implement these changes, if you don't radically change the organization, if you don't radically change the process, then you have a problem. And it's the ability for the IT organization also to become the chief innovation engine for their companies and their organizations, which is going to require more and more of the IT people being what? Understanding business outcomes and probably from outside of IT. That changes it from a company being agile, which was the top term in CIO vernacular two years ago. Being agile meant being quick. To being predictive, because when you're predictive, you're ahead of the game. That makes a difference in your company's economic growth. It also makes a difference in your CEO, him or her, having their job very long. That's a little bit of humor in case you missed it. Late in the day, I know. <laughs> and then it moves into where you really become hyper-aware. Hyper-aware of a city, of an opportunity or a challenge. Hyper-aware as a company in terms of a market transition. Hyper-aware instead of watching your orders coming in. Crowdsourcing off of social media to know that this new vehicle being introduced with this feature in terms of pedestrian capability or this feature in terms of engine is what you have to build well before the order line starts. That's the opportunity we have together in front of us. But it does require fast IT in ways that we haven't thought before. And at the heart of this is security. And to be very candid, two and a half years ago, I thought security would just be an element we'd do a little piece of, and a number of us would do it together. And I was sitting in a forum, and all of a sudden, one of my CEO counterparts, a real large high-tech company, was getting the tar beat out of him on security. I said, I'm glad to see him, not me. And then he said, you know, after thinking about this, this is Chambers' problem. <laughs> and I listened, and he said, it can only be solved an ecosystem approach with the network with the internet. It has to go from the cloud to the data center to the WAN to the access device with any device being connected. The firewalls will break down over time. It has to be an architecture where things come together to really anticipate the problems, to dramatically limit the number of effective attacks that can occur. When they occur, and I'm not going to ask the question how many people in this room have been broken into. Let me ask the question how many have not. So I don't create any legal problems exactly my point that will happen and when it does happen how do you minimize the damage how do you see it far enough ahead of time and how do you do restoration and then how do you really constantly keep ahead of the bad guys the organized crime the hackers the rogue nation states that will be required that only happens through architectures it only happens when you tie things uniquely together and so you think about where we're going. It's how do we do this together? And I'm going to ask Jim Grubb up on stage. Jim is my chief demonstration officer. We've done this for <laughs> more years than I like to remember. Probably over 15 years. That's right. I want you to take these concepts that all of us have talked about over the last two days, pull it together in terms of what does it mean in a way that we can understand how it actually ties together. All right, John. Well, we're going to build some cars today. A good and thing. I'm a car guy. We're going to really show how the ecosystem of folks in this room are bridging the IT and the OT technologies with architecture, yeah. with security, and with a fast IT model that allows us to deploy these things very quickly. So you're really going to tie it all together for us. Exactly. So if you'll join me over here, we're going to start by provisioning some new analytics capabilities. What we're looking at here is an IT dashboard that's built with Cisco's ACI technology. This is our software-defined technology that allows us to automate the deployment of new IT capabilities. It also allows applications to run wherever you want. So that's you don't right. have to bet is it going to be centralized or decentralized or somewhere in between. It relies on partners to make it happen. And you're going to show what's changed in this and why speed is suddenly being able with the fast IT That's organization. Right. So what I did is I just called up a template, and now I'm going to add some software to this template, a typical three-tier application. I'm going to add an Apache web server. Uh -huh. I'm going to add uh, an application server, Cisco Connected Analytics. You'll okay. hear more about that over the next coming weeks and months. And a Mongo database. And then I'm also going to take some layer four through seven services like firewall, uh, provisioning and load balancing and then what I'm going to do is click on apply changes and now what's happening in the background is we have just automated the process of building this three-tier applica application stack and it'll be up and running in just a couple of moments so if I'm not an IT guy I go what does that mean well the way that we did this in the past <laughs> 
the networking people configured the boxes, the, the storage people configured the SAN, the, yeah. the compute people configured the VMs. We've just automated all that process and taken something that might have taken three months and made it just a few miles clicks. So now you're talking about time to new applications, time to new services in days or even hours as opposed to how we did it just a short time ago That's right. in months or years. That's right. In our own data centers, we're down to eight minutes to provision a new set of workloads. And this is why you need architectures and the high-tech industry group working together with the customer segment. Exactly. I get it, Jim. Now, let's take a look at the data that's being generated by that analytics application that we just put together. So this is from a partner, Pentaho, that does data visualization. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at the total sales of our automobiles. We can see in real time the sales versus gross profit. It. I can see the different products that are trending, and this is coming real time from our dealers. So we can see that uh, the pedestrian detection system is now outselling the navigation system in our vehicles. Uh, we can see social media sentiment, uh, demographics. This is also so. In social media, you could literally see both what it is today in terms of sales, which is dramatically higher. That's right. You could all of a sudden tie it to how much more it's being talked about in social media, and instead of waiting to have a problem on orders, you see the problem coming That's way right. ahead you of time. You can see those trends. And so this is what you talk to the business people about. That's right. And this is where the data virtualization technology, bringing all these different disparate data sources together yeah. to give us this real-time visibility. Now, over here on the right, I can click on the order button, and yes. this will bring me right into my manufacturing planning system. And I can see in Flint, we're about at capacity. But if I click here on Toledo, I can just drag here to do some planning. And based on the inventory, the production line capacity, the number of machines and amount of space that we have, we can see that we can actually build six months worth of inventory of our new pedestrian detection system. So this is true of any industry in any group. And what this is how business will be run in the future with that type of speed. The ability to capture data much faster than we had before, sort the useful data from the data is just noise, understand the business implication of what you do, and literally with the touch of a finger change the models. This is exactly what Walmart is doing in their data cafes across all their product lines. They start with their basic uh, dashboard, then they explode it all the way down through and do what-if modeling to determine how they compete in the future, what's now, working, what's not. I want to set that production capacity in motion to retool our manufacturing line, so I'm yes. going to submit an order for that. I'm going to I'll go back and apply some security rules and some quality of service policies because we're going to be adding some robots, some wireless, and some switches. And so what I want to do is go in here where I have predefined policies that say things like the FANUC uh, 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 technician has access to the robot, but no one else does, for example. So this is how we secure the network, again, using our ACI capability. I also might want so to you apply... you think about multiple layers of security with multiple layers of uh, skill sets and, and the ability to also anticipate if there's a problem, you somebody going around it or otherwise. That's right. I just also applied some quality of service so the control traffic will have a priority reaching those devices. So in my terms, so that your most important applications get executed. Exactly. Okay, exactly. I got it. Now, just Now, join me I, as the factory floor technician. I might be responsible. I've got a mobile tablet here where I, as the factory floor technician, I might be responsible for provisioning uh, this new device. So any data to any device anywhere in the world and then the ability to summarize it back where you can make decisions on. Exactly, exactly. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is after we've installed the robot physically, I'm going to attach it to this Rockwell Stratic switch. And this is a joint development between Cisco and Rockwell, and as I attach the robot, you'll notice it's automatically discovered by the network because we pre-provisioned it, and it's now downloading its uh, quality of service and security policies and gearing up to be able to manufacture. So watch this transition. Let's use Rockwell as an example, but it's what we and other people in this room will be doing with the ecosystem. Rockwell used to use our products to kind of enable what they did. Then they begin to embed our products inside their products and our joint partners. Now we begin to co-innovate in terms of what we can do together. So this talks about where this industry is going and why you've got to have industry standards and the ecosystem to make That's it work. Right. We can bring that IT automation all the way down to the factory floor. Okay. Now one last thing as a technician on the floor, I'm just going to click here to uh, provision the software that will allow the manufacturing of our new pedestrian detection system. And 
it looks like we're all up and running. Pretty smart so, machine, I like that. We're going to let that run for a while here and okay. begin to manufacture. And John, if you'll join me back over okay. here, a couple of thousand miles away on okay. the other side of the stage, and we're going to take a look at how we can remotely monitor. So this truly talks about a virtual organization, common controls platforms, and your ability to really run your operation from wherever you want. Exactly. So you attend as example, doing the majority of the work in the mine area with literally very little human involvement. That's right, that's right. So on the left-hand side, we're looking at video and video analytics where we're able to detect, for example, a pedestrian in an area and automatically shut down the machinery. By the way, that analytics runs in the fog, right in the cameras. So and local, the local access, right. both, at the, both at the device That's and right. on the shop floor. Over here on the right, we're looking at an overview of all of our manufacturing facilities. So we get a single pane of glass to see what's happening. We can click to drill down. We can see what's happening forecast-wise, real-time. We're now getting real-time information on overall equipment effectiveness so this data is 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 real time we get video from the floor capacity planning and even things like network security this is our source fire uh, engine detecting threats or potential threats that might be within the network there yes it is looking like I'm getting an alarm here where we seem to be having a problem in one of our manufacturing pods and I'm also getting that alarm as a technician so let's go back over so you can send the data to any appropriate source to say how do we solve this now That's this right. often used to result in a whole line being shut down for a period of time. Hottest okay. application going now is bringing the expert to the exact site. That's right. As opposed That's to right. Physically. And also, as a technician, I'm getting a map on showing me on the factory floor where the problem is occurring, so I can get there very quickly. Yes. Now, what I'm going to do is I'll just click here, and this will give me the ability to drill down a little further, but let's assume for a moment that I'm not familiar with this particular part assembly that's having a problem, and I okay. need an expert. Okay. So what I'm going to do is click on contact support on the bottom of the screen here and this is using Cisco's uh, mobile advisor technology to allow us then to talk to an expert who will then help us to solve the problem that we're having here. Hi there. Hi there. Good afternoon, Jim. This is Mark. Uh, I was looking over your log files, and it seems like you're having a process error. Yeah, we're having a problem with a little part right here. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up Mobile Advisor. That's going to let me see exactly what's on your screen as we're seeing it together. And uh, we'll take a look and troubleshoot this. Okay. So you begin to see collaboration. You begin to see Internet of Things. You begin to see cloud. You begin to see video architectures all come all together. All together. That's okay. right. All right, we're definitely seeing a Code 3E process alarm. So the first thing I'm going to need you to do, Jim, is to click the maintenance mode button. Okay, and, I'll uh, do that right here. Switch the uh, robot in maintenance mode. On my tablet. Okay. It's in All right. Mode. And with that done, I'm going to share a troubleshooting document with you. All right, I'm getting that troubleshooting document on my tablet. Great, device. let me point this out. Uh, in the lower left of the block assembly, you're going to see it looks like you have a loose stem fastener. Ah, okay. Uh, right, so all you need to do is pop the top off and tighten that up. Okay, all right. Oh, I can you. do that. If you right. hold that for me, John, we'll, we'll find the... like a process you do that if you hold that for me John we'll we'll find the it sounds like a process you've got a good chance of solving yeah <laughs> all right we'll go ahead and tighten that up all right I think we got it got it all set and we all grasp this could be changing a part it could be doing almost anything but the ability to bring that expert in and solve the problem I that's right it. anything else we need to do now uh, you just need to click the maintenance mode button again to take the robot out of maintenance mode okay. and you should I'll be all that. set so simple Smart, secure. That's right. And we've just fixed the problem, and we're back up in line and running just within minutes. It's amazing. Smart. Hello, John Chambers. I think the robot's talking to us, John. I also you. <laughs> that may be our new predictive analytics capability. <laughs> Thank you. All right. John, you have the clicker. You have the, yes, I do. I'm gonna borrow. I'm gonna borrow the clicker because I want to show a network diagram of all of the different components in the architectures yeah, 
that we use there. So this is our diagram of our manufacturing operation. Mm -hmm. We use a number of different architectures, our ACI architecture and software defined And why this is important, this is all about speed. Architectures you allow you to move with speed with dramatically lower costs integrated together. So we as an ecosystem group can say, here's how each of us play to make this happen for our customers. So here's our ACI architecture that we use to provision and deploy the new services. The intercloud technology that allowed that service to be deployed on-prem or off-prem or in the fog. Our IoT architecture where we extend all the way down into the switch in the manufacturing floor and the fog technologies for analytics. Mobility that gave us the ability to view that data from any device in any location. Our collaboration technology and architecture that allowed us then to bring in the remote expert. And then of course security running across all of this to give us the ability to make sure that this is a secure environment. But John, it's really about all of these architectures working together that give us the ability to build a world-class ecosystem-driven partnership that gives us the ability then to deploy IoT solutions like this. Jim, I get it. Well done. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Also, don't roll the video. So if we look at where we're going as an uh, organization, uh, the next uh, guest I'd like to bring on stage is Mayor Rahm Emanuel from here in uh, Chicago. When you go around the world, the first thing we do when we talk about a smart city is you meet the mayor, and if she or he really isn't bought in to why this change in education, how they would use this to increase the uh, effectiveness and the quality of life of their residents or citizens, depending on how you call it, if they don't understand that, you go to the next city. The second thing you do is to see if they've got a CIO organization that can really deliver. This city has been able to deliver. I think most of us have been watching the unemployment numbers. They've had the most improvement in the last 12 months of any other major city in the U.S., down to 2.8%. You watch how they focused on education and got their dropout rate to dramatically reduce versus absolutely right for the residents of this city, but it also gives you the right feeling as business leaders locating your employment group here. They grasp how technology and data could really transform the lives of citizens, create an environment that would be the most friendly environment Environment for new residents and keeping existing residents and family here. In short, the city has done an amazing job. So over the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'm going to invite one of the, I think, best mayors in the world to join me on stage to discuss what Chicago is doing and how does it meet its goals. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Rahm Emanuel. <laughs> So we're going to get a couple chairs brought out, but before we, we bring it out, we had a chance to discuss a number of issues, which I'll get to in a second. But the one thing that I'm most excited about and proud about is what you've been able to do in education. How did you change, please, okay. uh, how did you change the attitude in education? This is the first time I've ever sat to the right of you. That is true. I hate to say it, but I'm a very moderate Republican. That's an endangered species <laughs> who actually loves Democrats, which is even worse. <laughs> but we're right on our politics there, and we got to know each other. We eyes the White House. That's right. But this is the biggest problem facing our country. If you were to say the two or three things that made such a difference that you were enabled to enact here in Chicago that suddenly dramatically cut the dropout rate, that got people excited about staying in school, what was it that you did differently than the rest of the country? Well, uh, spent some political capital. I made pledges in the campaign, and I saw them through. Uh, just to walk through a couple of things. First of all, the biggest thing is we have a pre-K to college strategy, so it's not isolated. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, uh, uh, we added universal full day for every child in the city of Chicago, seven hours a day. And we cut overtime for all uh, uh, basically operating engineers, electrical, uh, IBW electricians. You get on it every time, you have to finish in eight hours. And we took all that money and made sure every child has a full seven hour day. And we just today, uh, or this week, announced we're doing universal pre-K for all four year olds at uh, kids from low-income families. The other thing we've done is we've actually, what is focused on, I added an hour and 15 minutes to every day, mm -hmm. two weeks to every year. It's the single largest increase in time in school ever in the United States. Every child from kindergarten to high school gets two and a half more years of classroom time than they did before. And, uh, 
third, in, a, in addition to that, we've expanded opportunities like we have now the largest international baccalaureate program in the country, right here in the city of Chicago. And the biggest piece, I would say, beyond those two pieces, early childhood, is that I've also uh, focused on school principals. There are three things that are essential to education. An engage, an engage and involved parent, a teacher that motivates, and a principal that's not scared of being held accountable. We told principals, you're going to have uh, the influence in your building, but we're going to hold you accountable for results. Here's your plan. Every, every year we update a five-year plan by school. And we drove them to a point of accountability, and then we put all that information public by school to parents. Rather than say, okay, what are we going to do overall? Each school had a plan base because the student bodies are different. The teacher cores are different. And making sure that the principals are held accountable, rather than just say it's by classroom, because I can show you literally schools where we put a new principal in three years, and one of them I'll give by example, Gwendolyn Brooks on the south side in Pullman in this area, all the way on the south side of the city of Chicago, near Indiana. New principal got there three years ago. It's now the 13th best high school in the state of Illinois. And I can give you, and there's good teacher corps, but the principal makes that difference. And you have to hold, you know, you have somebody run your office in Spain, right? Yes. Well, that person's accountable. You want to make changes, you want to drive change, you have to get your hand. I got 635 principals and 26,000 teachers. Where are you going to drive change and who are you going to hold accountable? We've given them the tools so they can to write their own plan, and then we measure them by their success. And we're the only school system, not that this is what drives a principal. Mm -hmm. We have a bonus system for principals that meet or exceed their goals. Now, nobody gets in there, so I'm going to get my 5,000 or 10,000 bonus, but it's a recognition for what they've accomplished. So those, those are the driving things that when you pay people for something, that's what you want them to do. Well, there is that assumption. I do. I think they're educators first. Yes. Uh, let me also say what I'm proud of is when I became mayor three years ago, our graduation rate was 57%. This year it's 70, last year it was 70%. Sophomore class will be 82%. The freshman class will be 85%. And that is a, and literally. <laughs> and then I will, uh, because I know we have a lot to talk. The one other thing I would say, and I try to drive, it's not hard to drive this because Barbara, uh, who runs the schools for me, I believe kids start dropping out of college in third grade. They don't drop out freshman year. They don't quit junior year. They drop out in third grade. And you, our responsibility is to make sure they're ready for third grade by three years old. And that's a different way. And somebody said to me, well, how are you going to drive your graduation rate even farther? I said, I'm going to get more and more kids involved in pre-K. That's how you drive your graduate rate better. And this week we announced, starting next year, if you get a 3.0 in public high school, our community college will be free. We're going to make sure that every child knows that graduation is only one milestone on your road of education. We have the lar second largest community college system in the country. Each school is aligned with an industry. So Wright College is IT, Kennedy King Hospitality, Olive Harvey Transportation Distribution Logistic, Richard J. Daly Advanced Manufacturing, blah, 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 113 companies. Blah, 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 blah is an official word here in Chicago. And, uh, and it's half Yiddish, half uh, English. And that school is specialized there. Yes. And uh, our enrollment is not only up, our graduation doubled. We're on track by 2018 to triple. And we have a metric system to measure each progress in our community college system that the World Bank just called the single best career education system in America. So you can see why I like this man so well. He, he's driven by data and results. Now... The IOT is a concept that when you made a decision to head your city this way, it wasn't a given that it would work. And yet you took the risk. You got a very good CIO. I think you ought to give her a raise, by the way. And if she ever wants to change, I will hire her in a second. Not happening. <laughs> but uh, what I'm really talking about is you to say this was going to be more than cars and education and health care and citizens and how did you come about? John, I mean, I did work uh, in government, I mean, in the White House and stuff, but information is power. Mm -hmm. And part of what's hard for government is to adjust the idea that you want to give that information out, especially in the city of Chicago. Okay. So we have a lot of data. Yeah. How to make that data information, and then how to make that information commercialized. And unless you make that data public, mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to get the commercialization, let alone data go translated into information. That's one. 
Two, uh, I would also argue one of the things that uh, we're trying to do, and it came from a mistake. Uh, I was trying to speed up, but when I have a view, uh, time online. I want to be able to measure time online to know if we're actually, if you can't measure something, you can't hold anybody accountable. So how long is a business in line for uh, getting an application or getting a license or getting a permit? And if I can't measure that, I can't know if we're making progress or falling behind. Mm -hmm. And we try to do something with technology for the building permits. If you're going to be a small business and buy the uh, space next door, how long does it get to get a permit? I kept telling them, look, I was a congressman. It took me six months to get the permit to do an addition and four months to build it. That's screwy. Now, what happened was we did a great job for software for the app, uh, architects, but the software we did did not communicate with zoning. Mm -hmm. And then this stuff started piling up. Now we figured out how to paper it over. I said, well, that's it. I've had it. We're going to create one office for the entire city of Chicago for information technology and coordination of that effort. And because I'm not going to a place where people are not looking at the city of Chicago from a silo perspective. And the other thing we're doing is the, uh, we have a small business center, one-stop shop. By 2016, it will be paperless. <coughs> Now, you guys may not think that's cool, but trust me, if you're stuck in the 20th century, and I'm talking about the mid-20th century, like that's a big leap forward. <laughs> uh, and I want to make uh, the, so my main goal is, because if you're a small business, you're starting up, you're, you're with your customers. You don't really start dealing with City Hall till 9 o'clock at night. And I want you to be able to talk to the city uh, and interact with the city of your business when you want, not when we're, we want. Now, the biggest thing that I'm really excited about. Mm -hmm. Our Chicago library system has 80 neighborhood libraries. It's bigger than Manhattan and Brooklyn's combined. We were just rated number one in the world, number three, number one in the United States, number three in the world, beating Beijing and Shanghai. Not that I'm competitive. <laughs> but I, get, I brought a gentleman in from uh, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on libraries mm -hmm. to run the library. I said, you turn the library into a 24-7 operation. I don't want it open to 6 o'clock in the evening and then shut down. We now have a system that if you have a library card, which is free, you can go online in English or Spanish and get tutoring in any subject from kindergarten to calculus. Free. And the reason I was adamant about that is, obviously if something my kids need help, I can provide that. If you're recently to this country, or if you don't have a college education as a parent, you try helping a kid with eighth grade algebra. And I want that online so our kids can excel. And now you can get free help. You want to write a paper on 1812, the War of 1812? Online chat from 11 o'clock in the afternoon morning to 11 o'clock at night, English or Spanish, any subject. And the library system now is literally partnering, not siloed, with our school system. So we know what the kids are working on in that area. Mm -hmm. And the library it has a teacher in the library and a system to help provide, so after school there is a lot. A teacher, tutoring, we can go home, live chat on homework help. And I think that's the best thing we can do to keep moving our graduation rate and keep in, advancing our kids educationally. So you've hit on a lot of the advantages, both economic, social, and, and right. yeah, advantages for your residents. What keeps you up at night? What worries you as you make these transitions? This conference. Because uh, I can't turn the TV out of my house without asking my 15-year-old to come downstairs. Uh, well, there's a, first of all, here's what keeps me up at night. You're in a city uh, with the fastest-growing central business district in America. And that's not me, that's Cranes. If you drew a two-mile radius around where you are right now, it's the fastest-growing central business district in America. We're the number one for corporate relocations, the number one city people are moving into, and I can go down the list. And, as John mentioned earlier in the introduction, our unemployment biggest drop. Yes. What keeps me up at night is that if a child in Woodlawn on the south side, or a child in Albany Park on the northwest side, or a child in back of the yards on the southwest side of the city of Chicago, looks downtown and sees the power held in our skyline, the energy, do they think that's like three miles away from them? Or do they think it's just another city? Not that they would have to work downtown to have a future. But do they think this city that's on the move, this city that's making progress, do they think that city encompasses them or it's just a whole separate deal? And so what keeps me up at night, and the reason I ran and the reason I'm, I love what I do, and I really love it, I think it's the best job I ever had and I had great jobs, 
is that you can make a difference in kids' lives if you're willing to take the political capital, spend it, and give them an education system. I am here, you're here, two reasons. The love of our parents and the education we got. And I've walked through a great door of opportunity. I, I have the parents that love me and hit me on the head. But my job is when I reach back, because I've walked through that door of opportunity, to grab somebody else's hand, not a door handle, and pull it shut. And the only way to pull somebody through that door is an education. And I kind of make sure that the school systems we have, the education we have in the classroom, literally means leave no child behind. That we don't have a tier system where certain kids are going to excel because of what their parents earn, what their parents can provide, and where they go to school, versus making sure that we're leveling the playing field. We are all here because we had an education. Different backgrounds, different experiences, but an education. And what keeps me up at night is that the city that's growing and moving, mm -hmm. not everybody has a chance to participate in that success, and I have a responsibility and I have to be held accountable. They have a shot at it. And this is why I also wanted to be here besides you being a friend and Cisco. If you don't know this, Cisco did a great thing for us. We have five schools that go from ninth to 14th grade. They get Every child gets a mentor, a tutor. They finish 14th grade in stand, good standing. They're guaranteed a job interview. Uh, with Cisco at 50000 a year. That school is Michelle Clark on the west side. It's predominantly, uh, predominantly meaning almost 100% African American, and it has a 94% on, uh, on track for graduation. And because you're willing to invest in the future, I want it to be here, but I want to make sure the kids of Cisco one day, because they did what they did, can sit here with you. And that's the most important thing I can do. You talked about parents that make such a difference in our lives, and you've hit on, in my opinion, one of the two equalizers of life is education. Mm -hmm. Now, the other part is the internet and our view about the connectivity of the internet of everything. Fast forward five years from now. Describe what Chicago looks like five years from now and how the combination of education and this internet technology can really change the city and what you would like to have written if you were writing today the front page on here's how Chicago leads the nation and leads the world. Well, uh, we've done, a, here's what I, I see. <clears throat> and one of your uh, members from Cisco, you guys are partnering today uh, with the University of Chicago in mm -hmm. our innovation. We, when I was mayor, there were zero innovation spaces. There are 10 open today and an 11th coming online just in the medical device area. Mm -hmm. 1871 and the new one with University of Illinois and Booth Business School, University of Chicago, which Cisco's partnering with from an investment standpoint, bringing those two schools together, both entrepreneurship, engineering, computer science. I want to see the city of Chicago that not only has those innovation spaces, but when I was looking at your technology, we've brought in the last three years the city of Chicago now is going to be the center for all digital manufacturing research in the United States. Five-year grant from the Department of Defense and Department of Commerce. We, through Argonne, U of C, and the city of Chicago, we now have a five-year grant from the Department of Energy on the ne next, battery, next battery research and storage. Northwestern is building a 4,000-person medical device center in research. So I want to be the center of the next big thing, in the next big thing in the city of Big Shoulders. Uh, because I believe if you bring research, the universities together, your company, my city, will succeed. It is the universities and the research spaces and the innovation spaces that commercialize ideas. And the biggest challenge I have is to make sure it's, I wouldn't say democratized, but more, it is the change that technology provides is not a threat, or as I call it, not a foe, but a friend. I used to joke with President uh, Obama, and now I joke to myself about it. People hate the status quo, and they're not too excited by change either. And they got us right where they want us. Yes. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, all of us in this room, I don't know you, we are prepared for change. For too many people, change is a fear that they can't handle. Being adept at technology making sure that technology is a friend for them rather than a foe that allows them then to adapt to that change and make the most of it is what I want to see in the next five years, which is from universities to kindergarten, from research capacities, and then opportunities that are spread wide. I think we're on the way to doing it. We have a lot of work ahead of us. But uh, what you're doing in this forum and this uh, idea of the Internet of Things, what we're trying to do in the city dovetail in making sure that 
the change that's coming, and it is coming at a pace and a capacity that nobody uh, was ever prepared for. I mean, I have a not the, I mean, I have a master's degree. My wife has two master's degrees. We're not prepared for this change. It is it is a threat, and I got to make sure people are more adept. And one of the other things I forgot to I left out in three years uh, time. You can't graduate from high school in the city of Chicago if you didn't take code writing and computer science. We're making it mandatory. And then making it absolutely... Uh, uh, I do believe, uh, when I was growing up, you were growing up, uh, bilingual meant English and Spanish. Bilingual, the number one language in that bilingual will be computer code writing. You may speak Spanish and you may speak English as the other language, you may speak all three. But code writing will be the language of, of bilingual. It will be the one constant. And I want to make sure again, constantly in our schools, we are preparing kids to make the most of change. Uh, because for their parents, it's frightening. And I got to make sure it's something that's more seen as something they can access rather than something that's threatening. Mr. Mayor, I want to thank you for taking the time today. I also, uh, the mayor uses the word political capital. I use the word courage just to do the right thing. And I want to thank you for just doing the right thing and having the courage to do it. Thanks. I also must say that it was a pleasure being on your left, although it's probably the exception. That's right. <laughs> but, it gives you, but it does give you a whole new perspective of what things look like. It sure does. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. When you think about where we're going, it's the ability to capture the information. And as we, if you're familiar with Jeffrey Moore's crossing the chasm concept, we have done the early innovators and the early majority. We're now moving across the chasm to the next generation starting to move on Main Street. The next leverage point will be around analytics. And if you fast forward to next year's session, I think you're going to see more and more emphasis on analytics and how do we bring that to the right person at the right time to make the right decision for the right outcome. The other thing you're going to see is more and more of the technology being completely transparent where it runs. The concept of fog, which basically says, let's move the compute power, let's move the networking power, the storage, anywhere, and make it completely transparent to the user where it is with proper security and architecture to make that happen. What you begin to do when you combine this is you begin to move with the speed that really allows you to get the business results, the results for the children, as the mayor talked about, the capability to really make a difference in global competitiveness. And as we do this as an ecosystem, I'd like for you to think about each of you in your individual organizations, thinking about the approach that you're going to take that will be different in terms of distinguishing yourself for the long run. I'll walk through what Cisco is trying to do to be different, first so that you can understand I don't want to just say something and not do the same ourselves, but also to challenge you a little bit of what will be your differentiation long term as we bring this ecosystem together. We focus on market transitions. We don't focus on competitors. We focus on bringing products, 18 different product families together in architectures with an ecosystem of partners that allows you to bring business results at much lower cost with much higher speed. We think about the business case, and when I talk to business and government leaders and use Israel as an example or use Walmart as an example, I didn't mention a technology term in terms of routers or switches or storage or processors once. I talked entirely about business case outcomes. Getting the reference accounts so that you have in each industry somewhere between two and ten examples that have done this, so there's no quicker way to get a joint customer to do it than say, here's what we did together at another account. To follow with investments in venture, we're putting $100 million into startup opportunities in IoT. And you'll see a lot more money follow that, both in investments and in acquisitions. And certification for education, because we quickly jointly run out of cycles about the people that can really make this happen. So we'll take our network academies, where we do 1.2 million students a year, no social promotion. 90% of the students use what they learned in the network academies every single day, whether they did that in high school or college. And we did it around networking. We're now going to do it around industrial IoT. We're going to do it around cyber security. And we're going to do it around business outcomes to where you teach people how do you get the business outcome you want by using these technologies. It is the courage to take those risks 
some of which will work out and some will not. Innovation centers like the mayor talked about around the Internet of Things, where we can come together, the groups here and the startups, to really make a difference. It is something that we have to think about how these architectures play together. And as you begin